Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the INSEAD Dean's Fireside Chats on the topic of driving transformation in business education. Thank you for joining us here live in Fontainebleau on the INSEAD Europe campus and from around the world online. We are delighted to bring our community together as we embark upon a new chapter of our unique institution. I'm Rachel Maguire, the Global Director of Communications at INSEAD, and I have the privilege to be joined by not one, but two INSEAD deans today, <laughs> who will talk to us about their roles as deans and share their thoughts on the current challenges facing business education today and in the future. I have the great pleasure to welcome the longest serving INSEAD Dean, Professor Ilian Mihoff, who will step down at the end of August after an incredible decade, and our incoming Dean, Pro Professor Francisco Veloso, who officially takes the helm as the next INSEAD Dean on September 1st. So to begin, you've both been deans for over a decade. Ilian here at INSEAD and Francisco at Catolica Lisbon School of Business and Economics and then Imperial College Business School. Ilian, can you perhaps recall what first put you on this path of becoming the Dean of INSEAD? I, <laughs> I have no idea what put me on the path. What have I done wrong? You know? But uh, yeah, so I started INSEAD in 96. Many of you know this quite well. Many of you have been with me since 96 here. So I started as Dean of Research in 2010, 2011 Dean of Faculty. And then in 2013, I was asked to serve as a Dean. Uh, to be honest, I did not necessarily envision myself as a Dean, but uh, I felt that it is time to serve and I decided to go ahead and do that. Um, I realize that the, the task is much, much, much more complex than <laughs> what, it seems, what, what it seemed even from inside, forget about the outside. Um, and I think that uh, you know, it, it was over time, uh, obviously I grew into the role, and then people say me, but ask me, but why you know, if you're so reluctant to serve uh, as a dean, why did you do two terms or just one? And I think that the answer is the inspiration that I got from the community, especially <coughs> Andre Hoffman. So actually, Andre mentioned this yesterday as well, that uh, his uh, precondition for setting up the Institute for Business and Society was to see me as a dean also to, to see this grow. And it was very inspirational because at this point, it's not about just you know, having an institution to manage and having the best business school to manage but it was also how do we change management education. So I think that it was, you know, it, it really, you know, inspired me to go on for 10 years. Francisco, could you tell us a little about what led you to academia and how your first deanship at Catholica came about? So I've also been an, an academic, you know, kind of was, I think my career has also been a little bit of a process of discovery in, in several dimensions because, you know, I started uh, as a physics undergraduate and here I am, you know, dean of a, of, a business, of a business school. And so I, you know, initially it started because I got interested in issues of kind of innovation, you know, kind of like how technology science kind of makes it to the, to the market and, and has a, an economic impact. And so I thought, and, you know, and as a, as, a, and as a physics major, I then I discovered that you could actually study that and do a PhD of that. And then I went and did that. And then stayed for, for 10 years as a, uh, as a, as a faculty member at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon. So I, for my PhD, I moved to the US. Um, and I was a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon. And I was you know, very happy there. I really enjoyed the, the university, the work that I was doing um, on the academic side. Then what happened is, is that I had, over the last three years of my term at um, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, I'd become very involved back with Portugal because there was a very large collaboration between, uh, between Carnegie Mellon and several uh, Portuguese universities, one of them being Catholic Lisbon. And then when the previous dean stepped down, you know, I'd been involved, we had set up a, a joint PhD program. I've had program leadership roles in, in, uh, at Carnegie Mellon and through this big collaboration, I was on the, on the governing committee of that. 
And then a little bit like Ilian, you know, to my surprise, when the previous dean stepped down to become the head of the National Regulatory Agency, so it was not planned. The, the faculty and the rector invited me to, to step up as a, as a dean for Catholica. And you know, I was full on, I had six PhD students, I was very involved in my work. Um, and so it was like this kind of situation, okay, well, that's a change in trajectory. At that time, it helped that I had you know, family incentive to go back to Portugal as well, because my, my wife was in Portugal for a, a variety of family, of family reasons. And so I said, okay, let's try it. And, um, and, then, uh, and then that, uh, at the beginning, was a discovery. And, and so I did that for a few years at Catholic, and I enjoyed it. And I think, as Ilian said, I think as the beginning was a little bit of a discovery. But then when I was renewed at Catholic for the first time, then it was a conscious decision. I wanted to continue to serve in this role. And then certainly when I went to Imperial and here, you know, you feel that you can hopefully make a difference and contribute to the institution, but also more broadly to the, to the world because business schools have and will continue to have, uh, you know, a major, major role in today's business and society. And, and it's an, an incredible privilege to, to be able to be uh, part of, a, of an institution such as INSEAD to really try to, to drive this, this transformation. So that's been a little bit the trajectory as well. Thank you, thank you, Francisco. So both of you, after these unexpected starts as deans, uh, there have been many, many achievements. So maybe Ilian, during your time at INSEAD, you could tell us what you're most proud of. That's not an easy question to answer. <laughs> not because uh, they're not great achievements in the school, but I would say what I'm happy with. You know, I, I'm not sure proud. So I think that the first thing that I would always say is that um, we managed to create uh, this vibrant learning community, whether it is inside INSEAD or whether it is the alumni community. And when I started as a dean, one of our alums asked me, you know, how would you know that your deanship five years later will be successful? So of course, nobody expected me to stay 10 years. And I was thinking, I have no idea where it might be my office is, I have no idea, you know, how to look at the budget, but, you know, vision five years ahead. But then I said to me, actually, if we can connect the students with the faculty, the staff, the alumni, and be closer and learn together, I think that will be invincible. And I think that we've gone a long way there. I'm very happy with this. And you could see the last weekend with so many alumni coming back for the campaign celebration. You'll see next weekend, uh, but also inside the school, we see it more and more happening. The second thing, which actually Francisco pointed out to me when I was answering a similar question in, uh, in, uh, uh, in London, um, uh, I think that actually we did change the management education with the business and society paradigm. And we started earlier than others. Uh, in, in the beginning, it was more of an intuition. Business must be a force for good, because if it's not a force for good, what are we doing here? So, and it was not clear, but today, and last weekend when we're doing the uh, Hoffman Institute celebration, people could see that the school, through the Hoffman Institute, has made a big impact, not only at INSEAD, not only now changing our curriculum, but also in other schools. Uh, so Javier, our dean of faculty, was saying that last year, the responsible research for uh, business and management, he came back from Wharton and he said, we are in danger because everybody now talks about business as a force for good. And I was thinking, you know, that's actually a good thing. It's, uh, I think it is good that people talk about this. Right? So Javier is here. Uh, so I think that that's, that's a big contribution of the school. It's not just mine, but to, to, to what is happening out there. I mean, there are a lot of uh, factual things out there that I think that the school should be proud. But I want to say that in my view, the age of INSEAD is just starting. So I, I really hope and I think that it is possible for Francisco to stay for 10 years <laughs> and take the school to the next level. There are a lot of things that are in the right place, but it, we're not there yet. Thank you, Ilian. Um, so the question back to you, Francisco, among your many achievements as dean, whether it be at Catolica or Imperial, um, which ones really stand out for you? I mean, like, like Ilian said, I mean, I think particular 
facts sometimes are, are harder because of one, one of the roles that we have as dean is to look at the overall picture and the overall sets of uh, issues. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a few elements that I think are quite important, uh, certainly on the trajectory of, uh, of Imperial where, where I've been over the last few years. One has been to kind of grow and develop the school. I mean, the school um, is very young still, not even 20 years old. And, uh, and certainly when I arrived, it was still quite subscale. There was about 70 academics. And so an important part of that was to create a little bit of, um, a little bit more of a, of a scale, just to give you a sense of, you know, we were 70 uh, faculty members. The next, uh, th there's four faculties at, uh, at Imperial. The, the other one has, you know, 300 and, um, uh, and 20 faculties, right? So there's a, a very big, big gap if you want to do things collectively, for, for example. So that, that's, that has been an important part to create a platform for the school to, to grow and, uh, uh, and development. The second aspect is innovation. I mean, this is personally, but, but certainly being at Imperial College, uh, which is a major driving force in science, technology, uh, you know, innovation needed to be a very important force of what the, of what the school um, uh, standed for. And we really pushed those boundaries on, for example, the way that we do digital, the way that we do hybrids, um, you know, the blend between the two are two examples. But even in degree programs, I mean, for example, this, this year we created an undergraduate degree in, in economics, finance, and data science to precisely kind of combine the various elements of the, of the nature of, of Imperial. So it's not just about the digital, it's to think about where is business education, what it, what it needs, and how can we do and push things uh, forward. The other aspect that relates to this is that, you know, each business school has its own identity. And of course, since that is very different from Imperial College Business School, I mean, the strengths that, that the business school at Imperial has is to be part of a major leading technical university. And so a very important part of that was to really put the business schools part of the fabric of the university. So as we grew and as we developed, it's not just any business school, it's the business school of Imperial College. And this is something that I feel, I think, very, uh, very happy that that's the way that, that the, the university really feels that, is that it's a school that's involved and through many different examples, you know, connecting climate with finance, health with, with economics, you know, uh, analytics with social, uh, with social uh, development, you know, deep tech entrepreneurship. These are all things that are part of that reality and that manifest itself, you know, within this, this aspect. Then the final thing that comes back to, to also the point that, that, Ilian, that Ilian made is, you know, we need to look outside. So when we think about achievement, we can only know, not only look at what we do internally, we need to look about our contributions on the, on the broader world. And all of these elements that I was telling you about is to think about within the incarnation of the business school that I was leading, how can we contribute to the broader world, you know, to look to address these global challenges that we have uh, around us. Uh, and this is something that, that, that I feel, you know, that we've achieved in many ways given where the school is. And for example, you know, the, the fact that we, the school was, was rewarded uh, twice in a row with one of the awards on the Financial Times uh, Responsible Business Education Award is one in instance of, of that we're doing things not only looking internally, but how can we contribute to the broader world to advance sustainability, you know, inequality, you know, innovation, these, these are the things that matter. And when we think about our research, when we think about our students, it has to be about the impact that we have on the broader envi environment. And that needs to be a very important part of the way we think about our accomplishment, not just what we do, what we do internally. Thank you, Francisco. So from the pandemic to ongoing economic uncertainty, to the rapid developments in AI, this has been both a challenging and an exciting period for business education. Ilian, I'll put this question to you first. Can you give us your view of the business education landscape today? Where are we today? Well, again, it's a, it's a very broad question. So the business education is obviously continuously changing because of the change in the world. It's, uh, you know, we have to keep up, uh, you know, uh, abreast of all, all that is happening out there in the real world. But what I would say is that uh, a few things first, I would say that uh, the pandemic taught us one very important thing, and that is that uh, in-person education is here to stay. We thought that, uh, you know, before the pandemic, we were thinking it is quite possible that one day everybody will switch to online education and we don't need uh, classrooms, we don't need amphitheaters, 
why invest? We did get these questions from a lot of alumni. Why do you need a new Europe campus renewal project when actually people don't use this? And during the pandemic, we realized that actually a lot of companies canceled their programs because they wanted to be in person. So I think that education in general, but in particular business education, will be in person. In terms of the topics, uh, obviously there are two big topics out there, um, and there these are the digitalization and the changes associated with this, both what we teach, but also how we deliver our sessions. And the second one is what is called sustainability or business and society. And the second topic was a bit ignored. Uh, now it's coming more and more to the center, but still when I look around, uh, there is, uh, there is actually, there, there are very few schools that try to go all the way in saying we need to change all the courses. And I think that one thing that also I want to end up with this is that, you know, we are in a very good business in a sense that there might be changes between MBA, Master in Management, other degree programs, and uh, executive education. But the demand for business education overall, if you put everything together, is growing like never before. And sometimes people call this part of the lifelong learning journey, but it is just the demand for education throughout the lifetime of a person. So Francisco, the same question over to you. How do, how do you see the business education landscape today? Well, I think that of course, some of the aspects uh, coincide, um, or many of the aspects I think coincide <laughs> between Ilian and, and, uh, and me. Um, and so, of course, there are important changes that are happening. And, and, and I think I subscribe to, to all the points that, uh, that Ilian uh, made. But let me add a couple of uh, additional, uh, additional thoughts. One is to do with this, with this digital element and uh, the complexities and the opportunities that it brings. I think that. While I completely uh, agree with with Ilian that um, that on, that on campus is is he, is here to stay, it's not going to go away because there's a very important social component to the learning process, and, and in in many instances that I think that will become more relevant because people need to understand through the interactions with others what what works and doesn't work with this broader uncertainty world. But at the same time, you know, the digital is being infused into the way that we learn in so many different ways. And so the, the separation between digital and physical, I think, is going to be blurred increasingly into the, into the future, from the way that we bring ChatGPT to the way that we do, to do things, to the way that we do this. I mean, is this physical or is this digital? This is being transmitted. We we're having it here at the same time. So how would we characterize what we're trying, what we're trying to do here? And so that, I think, over the future, that's going to become even more, um, uh, more, more, more complex. Um, and you know, I, I think the, the lifelong learning that that that, that you asked um, for is, is also quite quite important. I think what, what I wanted to to add on is is something that I think also brings it back to the uh, to INSEAD, and this is something that I think is is, is an interesting bridge uh, to the between say kind of like my experience at Imperial and what I think um, that that. That INSEAD does in a very in a very particular way, which is there are individual components associated with the things that are changing. You need to understand the analytics. Marketing is now digital marketing. You need to understand all, all these all these toolkits. But one of the things that we're seeing is this really call for this different leadership approach. You know, courageous leaders, empathic leaders that understand the toolkits but are able to connect to people that are able to take decisions about purpose, about values, about inclusivity, right? And creating a safe space to develop these leaders, to make them comfortable with these things that are, are being called upon on them. I mean, they are going out there to the businesses to do these decisions. And creating that, that, that's, that safe space, that, that learning space, is something that INSEAD is really uniquely positioned in the world to be at the forefront. So this point that Ilian uh, very much pointed out, which is, there is a, a huge demand for business education, and that is both technical, more technical elements and technical elements in specific ways like business analytics and other things, but it's also in a very, very acute way this integrated general management approach that INSEAD is at the forefront of, of doing, and that is you know, extremely exciting on one hand, but it's very needed, which is the part that I think is quite, is quite important. Coming back to the specifics of INSEAD, um, 
we, we know that INSEAD has one of the largest MBA programs in the world. Yeah. There's been a lot of discussion in the media this year around the value of MBA programs. So Ilian, what are the shifts that you see in terms of both student and corporate expectations of the MBA now and going forward? Uh, <coughs> yes, indeed, I, I had many interviews on this topic, is MBA disappearing and so on. The MBA program is an extremely valuable program. I think that the transformation that happens during these or one, two years is completely, I think, at unparalleled with anything else uh, that I've seen out there in, in education. Uh, we, in my view, the big issue with the MBA, sometimes, it's a positive, I think, thing, but still, is that we need to teach them all that stuff that we used to teach them before. So you have to know what a balance sheet is and present uh, value calculations and so on. But on the top of this, you have to teach them machine learning, data analytics, data science. And on the top of this, you have to teach them about sustainability, about uh, sustainable finance and so on. So the, the program becomes very, very intensive. Now, is MBA losing its attractiveness or not? I think that management education, degree management education is increasing, but what we see more and more is that it's possible, it's a hypothesis at this point, because we still haven't seen it, but it is possible that the new generation thinks that let me do all my degree programs at once, you know, so undergraduate and master in management, and then the leadership component, which we developed very well during the MBA program with the personal leadership development program, with all the soft skills development and so on, this thing, many people think, you know what, I can take through the lifelong learning platforms. So the availability of lifelong learning modules, the availability of online courses, on the top of having really great uh, pre-experience programs, may have a shift, but it's not, it, it's a compositional shift, not the demand for management education. It's for, and it's only a hypothesis. And the other thing that I realized in the last two days, because again, this question comes up over and over again, and uh, is that today's world has become so dynamic. And it's, I know it's a cliche, right? So things are changing, but think about this. We're sitting in Fontainebleau in year 1000. And somebody asks you, what do you think it will be Fontainebleau like in year 1050? Well, you know, most people will probably have some good guesses and will be able to say, maybe somebody will say, oh, you know, I hear that there'll be a chateau being, that will be built in a couple of centuries and so on. But otherwise, you know, not much is happening. And if I ask you what will be the world like in 2073, I think nobody will dare to have a really good prediction. So, Things are changing very fast. What does it mean for the MBAs? I go into my workplace, I have all this dynamic work environment, and I'm really afraid to move out for a year or two to make this investment. People who do this never regret it, but the uncertainty and the dynamic nature of the world today maybe makes some people a little bit hesitant. So. But the demand for, for business education will increase, and I can elaborate later on that. So we've just heard from uh, Dean Mehoff about the, the MBA. Um, recently at INSEAD, we have really embedded sustainability uh, into our MBA curriculum. Um, so, so maybe we can look a little bit at the, the executive education situation with uh, Dean Veloso and how important is it to cultivate sustainability leadership among today's leaders and executives? Well, I think it's, it's absolutely uh, central. I mean, I think this builds on the on the conversation that we were having about the what the world what the world needs and what and the, what type of leaders it uh, it needs, and you know the the point that that relates to what Ilian was making is okay. People realize that they have their needs, and you know if you think about an executive that was trained 20 years ago, and has been you know going throughout throughout their their journey, I mean the skills the understanding gap at the moment is just unbelievable. I mean, any area, but both functional, we talked about, for example, marketing, you know, going to digital marketing and digital tools is absolutely essential. And certainly, you know, this is absolutely true on the technology side, but for example, you know, on the, and that's very much on the, sustain, on the sustainability. You know, I, I have conversations with, with business leaders that, for example, you know, after a few minutes, 
you know, you can realize quickly that they don't, know, they don't even understand very well what uh, uh, scope three, um, you know, is, right? And you were saying, how can this person be in this significant role and, and not understand this such important aspect? And there, and some of them, you know, have even made MBAs 20, 20 years ago. It's just that things have shifted so fast. So executive education and the education of executives needs to be absolutely essential to complement uh, you know the degree, the, the degree side, which is the, the, the point that Ilian was uh, uh, was making, and this is, I think, one of the aspects that is very powerful because precisely of the of the involvement that that Insead has on the executive edu education side, and so the opportunity and the need is gigantic, and certainly on, on this area because people increasingly, unfortunately, are realizing that um, you know they need to do something to create a more uh, prosperous, a more inclusive world, but a lot of the times. Even those leaders that have captured it, they don't understand very well what it, that means. They don't, they don't understand very well how to implement it. Okay, I want to do it, but how? How do I make it, how do I make it happen? And so starting to, there, there's a whole platform around the sustainability that schools like, 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 like INSEAD or like Imperial College in different ways can contribute to, to help them think about strategy execution, to help them think about how they can bring technology, to help, to help them think about how each of their own teams get to understand the specific aspects of, uh, of that. And so that's, that really needs to, and it is, fortunately, a central element of the way that we think um, currently about business uh, education and, and certainly uh, into the future. I think the issue that we will have, I see, um, you know, and I'll have to learn more about, about the INSEAD reality, but, but out of a few conversations that I'm getting that uh, already, which is, in some ways, the demand for rigorous, well-developed tool solutions in this space, we're going to have difficult supply that because of the time that it takes to train academics and to them get them to be at the forefront of these. I mean, if you think about a PhD, it takes five years, so train people into that, even from the academic side, it's, it's quite, um, it, you know, it takes quite a bit of time, um, and, and we don't have time. And so, Navigating through this is going to be quite, quite important. Let me actually elaborate on this as well, even though I said that we should not ask you the same <laughs> question. So. But uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, so last weekend we had uh, the uh, Responsible Research in Business and Management Conference and the Hoffman Global Institute for Business and Society celebration of uh, five-year anniversary. Uh, and there are a lot of talks, a lot of discussions there um, around these topics. In the Hoffman Institute conference, there was an amazing, mesmerizing lecture on the planetary boundaries. Uh, it was one of the most depressing talks that I've ever heard. Because uh, Johan uh, Rockström from the Potsdam Institute in Sweden basically presented where the world is heading, not only in terms of climate change, but a lot of other planetary boundaries, you know, things that I don't understand, nitrogen, phosphorus exchange, and things like this. But you look at all these things. And you know, these people, very hard science delivered in a very good way, understandable way, at least to people like me. So you look at this and then you realize that there are all these people, all these scientists, earth scientists, biologists, uh, physicists, and so on, they understand these things, they want to do something, but they cannot do anything. You know, they, some of them may start an NGO or some build awareness. At the end of the day, the solution to all these planetary boundaries will come 99% from business. And if we don't have these decision makers trained, give them a, somehow a, a framework of how to address these issues, how to manage their companies, nobody will. Our mindset has been in the past, the governments will do everything. The governments will solve the problems through regulation, through taxes, through whatever it needs to be done with climate, with carbon tax. No. It doesn't work anymore because businesses are much bigger and much more powerful than many governments. So in the RBM conference, I gave them uh, an example which uh, supports uh, exactly what Francisco was saying. We have this alumnus who is managing a $40 billion company in terms of market capitalization in the United States. He's an amazing person. He cares about poverty. He donates a lot of money to reduce poverty. He donates a lot of money to decrease discrimination and all these things. So he, he puts, 
his money where his mouth is, all these values that we hold as well here. And then I talked to him a year and a, a year and a half ago, yes. And I said, so how are you doing? How is the company? And so on. He said, well, the company is doing really well. But now with all these Black Rocks, Vanguards, all these investment companies and their ESG objectives, they come and interrogate me and they breathe at my neck all the time. I cannot manage my company. And I was thinking, he's a really caring guy about the planet and the people. Why, why is he now complaining that BlackRock has some ESG targets? And then I realized that because he does not have the toolbox. They have to invent on the go, how do I address this issue and that issue? And this is our failure. This is the failure of business schools, of management education institutions, that we have not created these frameworks. And like in strategy, oh, you have to rethink your strategy, you pull out a strategy textbook, you have the frameworks, you build a new strategy, and you propose it. But for sustainability, for ESG, as Francisco was saying, we still do not have these, you know, these people, these executives don't have the tools and the frameworks. So that's why we changed the MBA curriculum. Today, we cannot, with straight face, put MBAs out there and say, you know, they have an ESEAD STEM, they have been trained how to manage companies if they don't know what to do with sustainability. And that's, that's what, uh, of course, you know, some of them have gone before in their MBAs, they've missed this boat. So now we have to build executive education also to complement that. Thank you, Ilian. That leads me nicely into the next, uh, uh, onto the next question. So, so we, you mentioned that this weekend we had uh, two, two big events uh, at, at INSEAD here in, here in Fontainebleau, um, focusing a lot around responsible research um, and also social impacts. So question for you, Francisco, could you tell us how you believe business school can advance responsible research, which really has social impact? I think that's absolutely essential that we do that. And, and I think that, uh, as you were saying, what Eileen was mentioning around that, you know, immediately, you know, brings that point to the, to the forefront. I mean, the world is changing very, fa very fast. Take the, this issue on, on planetary boundings, right? For example, you know, we don't have established frameworks to really understand how to value natural capital in the, the balance sheets of a company. We don't. I mean, if we think about risk, I mean, all the frameworks that we have is backward looking. You know, you use and you infer from backward data to assess the risk of a particular market, a particular environment. Well, guess what? Most climate risks are forward looking, right? It's something that happen, completely different toolkits that needs, to be, that needs to be developed. So we as a business school need to be at the forefront of, uh, of creating these because they're, they don't exist and they're changing very quickly. And it's through research, it's through rigorous research that is able to, to do that. Because if we don't do that, people are gonna be, you know, the, your average consultant is gonna be selling what they feel works but may not work at all because they don't have the necessary assessment to, uh, to do that. That, that. That's one important aspect. But, you know, one thing that we need to realize, and this is, I think, on us, on the business schools, is to say that over, t I think historically, we thought we could perhaps worry more about having academic impact with the idea that that academic that impact would then trickle down to the broader economy. So that idea, oh, we want to have academic impact and then our ideas will then trickle down to the broader economy and we'll take in that. Even if you believe that that is true, there's no time for that, for the reasons precisely that, that uh, Ilian was mentioning. So we, it's our responsibility to think about that broader impact much more and a much more quicker pace. We cannot afford to just think, okay, that will trickle from the academic side into the broader impact. We need to ask ourselves, you know, what type of research are we doing and what are that broader impact? How is it gonna make a difference? And even the way that we orient, even if we think about the way that we orient our, our, our research, right? I mean, you can think about analytic tools to support the company, but you can also use it to support UNICEF or the World Economic, uh, uh, you know, the United, uh, the, the, the United Nations, right? As Ilin was saying, you know, you can think about general corporate strategy. What about sustainability strategy? I mean, put that in, in, the, in the corporate and, in, and, the, and, the, and the essence of what, uh, of what is done. You know, you can deploy your marketing toolkits to understand how a particular, you know, 
uh, internet provider augments its penetration in a particular segment, or you can use that, for example, to understand how you, how you target regulation to decrease the consumption of sugar in kids, for example. I mean, these are all things that we have the tools to do, but it's our responsibility, and this is not something that anybody's gonna tell us to do, it's on us our responsibility, you know, and I'm saying on us because I'm a sitting dean in a different school, I'll come here, so it's my responsibility, it's Ilian's, it's, you know, it's uh, Javier's, and it's, it's our responsibility to drive that change collectively, and that conference is quite important because that conference brings these minds together because many of these endeavors is not something that any individual school can do. That push towards research that is driving impact is something that it's our responsibility and obligation to do in each of our schools, but there's a collective action problem and an issue that has to be done collectively. So the instruments to really work in ensemble through responsible uh, business education to the initiatives that, um, that Business School for Climate Change, for example, that INSEAD has been, has been, uh, uh, has been part of, uh, is, are all parts of, of that in, in different ways. You know, for example, in the case of, of the reality of Imperial, we've had a big initiative in climate finance because we have the climate scientists, we have our finance people, we put them together, and that's something that the reality of that school can address in a very, in a very meaningful way. So it's different for each school, but the overall drive is there and, and very much needs to be there into the future. Thank you, uh, Francisco. Can I say just one thing? Yes, <laughs> okay. I can. No, I think that uh, because, again, Francisco is coming here, has tons of tools and, uh, you know, things that, uh, you know, he can do together with you. I think that it is important to understand why we created the Hoffman Institute for Business and Society. And I said it twice last week. We, the, one of the main reasons to have the Hoffman Institute is to eradicate fluff because all these, sometimes people create stories or create actions that on the, on, on the surface may seem to be right, you know, going in the right direction, but they could be counterproductive. If things are not verified by empirical research or don't have theoretical foundations, at some point they'll fire back because they don't work and then the critics of all this movement will say, you see, you were saying that this is important, it is not important. So that's why I think that the academia and business schools have to serve like guardians, you know, saying, you know, this is what we know. This is what science has proven or we have proven. And the other things that we don't know, we should not be acting on because it becomes dangerous or work. So a lot of work to be done there. I, as of September 1st, I'm going on the, in the trenches and, you know, fighting the work, uh, fighting this fight uh, on the front line because I think it's very important. Thank you, Ilian. So going a bit deeper into the topic of responsible business education, I know that you have both placed a lot of em emphasis on championing diversity. Um, so perhaps, Ilian, starting with you, you could expand upon some of the initiatives that, that you feel have had impact and explain why you think this is, this is really important to continue uh, working on. Around diversity. So I think that uh, INSEAD, uh, as we all know, uh, was built on the idea of diversity. So when, when we talk even about the last 10 years, when you ask me about the achievements, what I'm happy about, um, the clarification of business as a force for good and the business and society initiative, they're not my initiatives. They have been with the school for the last 60 years. What we did was just to bring a bit of clarity and to, to put them in words that were not there before. But 1959, Georges Doria wanted to create a business school that brings together people from Europe, that creates a space that promotes peace and prosperity. So from day one, diversity was part of the school DNA. So today, of course, diversity means much more than what uh, he thought at the time. And we have seen the value of diversity in the classroom. All of you who are involved in one way or another with the, the MBA or the executive education, you know how diversity in teams is helping people get better educated and get better ideas as well. So we created the Gender Diversity Initiative um, a few years back. We are participating in the He for She Alliance um, in, um, in the United Nations. By the way, that's an interesting story that very few people know. He for She Alliance is a group of uh, institutions, organizations that believe 
that in order to change the world and get closer to gender equality or parity, men have a role to play. So they're supposed to sponsor and help women also progress. So that's, that's the movement that was embraced by the United Nations about 10 years ago. We're the only academic institution that is a member of this uh, alliance. So others are governments uh, and uh, companies. The most exciting thing for me in the last year was to learn that the he for she movement was created by an INSEAD alumna from Indonesia, Doranita Josephine. She was working in Danone. She was the speaker at the EMBA graduation in December. And that's how I learned, you know, all of a sudden, you know, she starts saying that she created this thing. And of course, as a skeptical academic, I say, yeah, sure, you created it. <laughs> but then, you know, I go and I watch you know, a video, the CEO of Danone, when she was working in Danone, she's now the CEO of Air Asia Indonesia. So the, the CEO of Danone, on, in a panel like this with more people, he was saying, oh yeah, it's in New York. I have this, uh, this employee of the known in Indonesia, Veronita Josephine, who actually created this he for she idea that, you know, and then this was picked up by the United Nations. So us being part of this, we all obviously believe strongly that there are, uh, besides nationality, there are other dimensions of diversity that we need to address. And obviously gender is only one of those. It's for the benefit of everybody. It's not only for the group. Francisco, would you like to add something? Yes, I mean, I'd like to add, I mean, start, the starting point is, is of course, you know, the, the, uh, you know, very much in line, as, as you were saying, in, in terms of the aspects that, uh, that Ilian mentioned. Um, I wanted to complement with a, a couple of different things. So one is, you know, our responsibility because of the fact that we are training these leaders. And so if you want to create this, this inclusive, more in diverse and inclusive world, they need to value that, understand it, and, 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 and be prepared to act, to, act, to act on it. And so that, that's absolutely essential. It needs to be an essential part. And we also, as institutions, become beacons for that because there's always that thing about walking the talk. I mean, we have to do things in se ourselves to, to make sure that that is very present. And so this is something that I've been very involved in promoting diversity, but also creating an inclusive, an inclusive environment because that's the flip side um, of the diversity is, is not about just having diversity. We need to create an inclusive environment, an environment that really brings people together and that reflects things and acts on what is it needed to have that inclusive, that inclusive environment. And sometimes that, that can mean many different things. I'll give you one example. So one of the things that, that, I've, been, um, uh, that I've been involved is in the, something called the History Working Group at, uh, at Imperial College at the university level. Because, you know, Imperial, while the business school is quite young, you know, Imperial is 100 years, uh, over 100 years old. And if you look at the history of an institution like Imperial and, and, and you look at the people that, for example, you're celebrating in today's eyes, there's many questions that current students and staff ask about, should we be celebrating these people? I mean, from that perspective, you know, what were the environment that, in which they were? Um, and are people that we perhaps didn't celebrate enough because precisely that we did not value these issues as much as it is. And this is a very, very difficult discussion to create an inclusive environment because you have to balance that, th that element about this is not about erasing history because history is there, but it's also about trying to create a platform for discussion so that people feel comfortable because I can tell you that there are current students, for example, uh, of... Uh, of black ethnicity that feel very uncomfortable about some of the people that are associated with the history of Imperial, for example, uh, because of, you know, just for example, what their firms did at that time in terms of the way that they treated their, their, their group. So that, we cannot change the fact that that was part of the history of Imperial, but we need to find a way to recognize, discuss, and even to tell that these are not things that were done right and we, and we need to understand that there are things that should be done in one or, or the other. So creating an inclusive environment goes beyond the, the, the diversity and it is about an active set of instruments to really foster that inclusivity. And this is our, our, our responsibility both in our own organizations but it's certainly on the way that we're training our, our, our students. I mean, we created at, at Imperial this these, uh, uh, 
this module of working in diverse organizations that we that we that that all the the, the students across all programs they have to do it, it's compulsory made it compulsory and they really um, you know they were skeptical at the beginning but now I mean people really f understand the value and understand the reason doing it at the beginning before they engage with a diverse set of, of communities to better understand what they're up um, uh, inside and so this this is quite an important uh, a aspect thank you so as we move towards the the end of this fireside chat we're going to start looking into the future um, so Ilian what do you feel are some of the biggest issues we have talked about various things today but what do you feel are the biggest issues facing society and the, and what are the is the role of business schools to address these issues I think that uh, the sustainability agenda is, is probably the most important challenge that we have. Of course, artificial intelligence and the role of digitalization and how we'll, what will be our place as humans in the future world with AI uh, is also an important question. But you know, Paul Polman was, put it actually very, very well during his speech here on Saturday. Uh, we are trying to define sustainability, and we have a very long <laughs> definition of sustainability that we used in all for our sustainability review. But basically, he said sustainability is the answer to the question of what kind of world you want to leave to your children and their children and their children. And seeing the deterioration in climate, seeing all these forest fires and seeing the that actually, the, if you look at the reports from the IPCC, it's, it's actually getting worse. What they were projecting in the 1990s is not right because the world is changing much faster. And soon, you know, we might be, uh, you know, here in France, we might see more and more forest fires, which puts in danger a lot of people, obviously the livelihood and so on. And yet there is no clear action that will prevent this warming of, uh, of the... So as I said before, you know, 99% of the solutions will be driven by business. And therefore, we need to train these people. Thank you, Ilian. So a final question now uh, for Dean Veloso, looking also into the future and addressing the future of work, which is now a priority for all organizations around the world. Uh, everybody's asking themselves what this is going to look like. It is shifting very fast. So how do you think that business schools can anticipate the skills needed and deal with the transformations and getting the balance right between core knowledge and real-time skills? I mean, I wish I knew I had all the answers uh, <laughs> because, uh, of course, this is changing uh, very, very rapidly. But, but I think there are important um, aspects to, to, to bear in mind. One is to create a safe space for experimentation in a business school environment, which is quite important. I mean, we've talked about and the, the, the point that Dylan made about you know all these pressures that are being made into business leaders, you know, certain sustainability as you mentioned, but also the AI, the digital, the the equity and um, and the inclusion issues, all of these geopolitical, all of that. So, and when you combine all of that that's happening with the fact that that you now have on the on a new wave, which is the entry of the large language models and the type of, of access to, to knowledge that you have, you know, there's a very important shift that is happening because you, know, you have all these things on the background. You know, the age of Google was the age where, uh, and the other search engines would be an age of kind of like looking for facts and looking for information the tip of your hands. Now, with these large language models, you have encapsulated reasoning that is done in a statistical way, but still, but, but still done it, that is available to the top of your hand. So the question that we're going to, all going to have is how to navigate that. And so that finding a safe space to experiment, to, to deal with that, to learn how to uh, incorporate that as part of your, of your journey as a, as a business leader, you know, the business schools have to be the place to, 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 to do that. And so we need to create that safe, that safe environment for for the for our students to do that experimentation you know informed by you know real frameworks that's coming out of the research which is which what the aspects that we touched on and not just everything but then for them to be able to 
to do that. And so our role is academics is even going to be shifting a little bit, not the research side, because we already talked about that. That is, if anything, is, 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 there is, there's more opportunity and more need for us to, to do that. And as we talked about, do it the right way. But as we think about our engagement with the students, is to help them navigate, you know, just think about helping them to navigate uh, uh, hallucinations that these models have. I mean, we're going to have a lot of stuff that makes a lot of sense and a lot of stuff that makes no sense at all. How do you distinguish between the two? You know, how do you think about that in a creative way that can help you move, move, move forward? These, these are things that are going to be quite important for where we are and where we, where we will be and something that, that business schools, if they do it properly, will be at the, at the forefront of what it is to, to be able to be successful and to lead in these, uh, in these environments uh, in, a meaningful, in a meaningful way. Thank you. So, Ilian, before we close, do you have any final words for Francisco as he prepares <laughs> to take the helm of the Business School for the World? Well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, hmm, I think that uh, there, I think at NCR is an amazing school. So, you're joining a community that you saw over the weekend. It's just unbelievable. If um, I, I, I said in one of the speeches, if you play your cards right, you'll be engulfed in love that it's difficult to, to bear withstand sometimes. It's uh, just the community is fantastic. But of course, um, for me, it was not a bed of roses. Uh, it was a lot, of, uh, a lot of fights, a lot of difficulties. I have distilled my my knowledge into seven lessons. Uh, I could not make more out of this. <laughs> the, the, I think that it's, uh, and of course, there are a lot of things that we are discussing every week, twice a week, we discuss, you know, finances and so on. But uh, if I may, we have, uh, like in one minute, I share this with the faculty and with the board as well. I think that the first thing, the very prosaic thing that people have to understand is that despite the incredible effort of our AI, that is advancement in SEAD, we doubled you know, our endowment. Uh, we more than doubled our endowment. We have 370 million in the endowment, but we're competing with schools that have two to five billion endowments. So our model is still, financial model, is still actually quite fragile. And you know, there is a shock that hits us. We are not out of the woods yet. We've moved a long way, and actually the endowment helped us during the pandemic, you know, by transferring double the normal amount, helped us, you know, basically keep the jobs of everybody here and helped us, you know, go through the pandemic because otherwise it would have been very different. We would have missed 10 million, so you have to save 10 million from somewhere. So I think that, again, the fragility of the model is very important. The second lesson I would say is that the, the the com combination of rigor and relevance at INSEAD in the faculty, the vibrant intellectual environment that we have created is our competitive advantage. Without this, we will be in a much worse situation because either you're competing with only teaching schools or you compete with research schools that are only research and have 10 times our endowment and can pay professors you know, much more than what we are paying. So we have to do the combination of the two. And that's very important uh, lesson as well. The third lesson in my view is that we still have, as you know, a lot of work to do with the staff engagement. I think that a lot of our staff have dedicated their lives to INSEAD, have worked here for a long time, have contributed. And I think that next year with the CSP that uh, you will be doing and all these things, I think it will take it to the other level. The fourth thing that I would say is the alumni. The alumni were not our priority until I would say, let's say 15 years ago. I'm not the first dean who started looking at the alumni, but I was fortunate enough that I could communicate well with the alumni and they started coming back to reunions in bigger numbers and the donations, 92%, which is basically 280 million euros, were donated by alumni of INSEAD. And this is more than what the school has received in its entire history in terms of donations. So that's, that's their big and important part of our community. Um, I would say that the, the, 
the fifth uh, lesson is the innovation. And I'm very happy that Francisco is joining us because he's a much bigger expert than me in innovation. But we have, in degree, uh, we have a, a, such an opportunity to innovate and experiment in our executive education, what we're doing with the learning hub, with the online courses, with the uh, you know, live virtual classes and so on. But I think that we need to have an office or a dean of innovation or something like this, because you have to incubate these ideas. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, to get uh, there. And uh, the sixth lesson I would say is that uh, degree programs, we see the MBA, you talked about the MBA and so on. I think a between MBA and MIM will be able to keep 50%. And this is a very important statement. Executive education is going up through the roof, thanks to the amazing job that the, the, the team is doing. But it is very tempting to get back to where we were in the 90s, 80% of the revenues executive education and 20% from degree programs. And that's not a good thing, because at the end of the day, in the long run, the reputation of the school is driven by the alumni who are coming from degree programs. And the final lesson that I've learned is that stick with the mission and the vision, or create your own mission and vision, because if we don't have this vision of what we're doing here, it's very difficult to move forward. And we have a good vision. It's not my vision again, so it, of course you can have your own, but it's, it's something that the school has been standing for in the last 64 uh, years. So I can give you also more lessons, but I think that you, you don't have to take them. It's just my reflection on where we have been, so. So I will leave uh, some closing words as well to you, Francisco, before. Well, first is I want to uh, thank you, um, but thank the entire community as well for the warm uh, welcome that I've been feeling over the last um, uh, the last uh, few months. But uh, you know, with some intensity periods uh, <laughs> over the last few days as well, um, and uh, and it's been remarkable. I mean, I'm of course uh, you know feel privileged to have the opportunity to to take the helm at uh, at INSEAD. is is an amazing institution. I already had that perspective. But it was a distant perspective, and one of the things that uh, that Ilian mentioned has been precisely that, that that level of engagement, which is remarkable. It's really remarkable for the from the entire community. People really do care in a very unique way, and that's the entire community. You know, the faculty, the professional staff, the alumni, the the donors, and that is something that you know is very impacting in that sense because you know you get if, if you get all that love that love comes also with a lot of you know uh, demand right because <laughs> expectations come on the back on the back of that that's when we think about our families that's the way we think we think about that and it's uh, and and so I really want to to thank all of you and and to think how excited and to tell you how excited I am about what where the school is where the school can go the impact that it has had that is having that it can have and I very much look forward to work with, with, with all of you to continue to change the world, impact the lives of many, and, um, and as Ilian mentioned, to just make our planets and our lives much more fulfilling uh, and much better ones. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. I will now bring this fireside chat with INSEAD Dean uh, Ilian Mihov and our future INSEAD Dean Francisco Veloso to a close. Uh, I thank you both for this very inspiring uh, conversation, leading us towards the next chapter for the business school for the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.